Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the last study of this current week. As we prepare to look at the final verses of Daniel chapter 11, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction? Shall we also remember those that are now in the middle of a major fire and those that are unable to join us at this time in these meetings? Shall we bow before our Lord, praise him for his loving kindness and for all that he is doing on our behalf? Will you join me? Loving Father in heaven, we come before you now knowing that this world is soon to end. We ask, Father, for your guidance and your direction. As we open your word, as we look to study this that you would have us to understand at this time, may your will be done in our lives, in those lives around us that are currently undergoing the issues with these fires. We pray that you keep them safe, that your guidance, your hand, and your watch care is over them all. Help us now as we open your word. May our minds be ready to receive that, that you would have us to understand. <clears throat> be with us now in all things. For this, Father, we ask. For this, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. This portion was published on the 28th of March of 1871, which was the sixth day of the first month of the biblical year 5916 but was also the sixth day of the first month of the rabbinic year, 5632, and the sixth day of the first month of the Islamic year, 1288. So we have another one of these periods where three different calendars converge. We begin here with verse 41. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Why is it worthy for us to note that Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon would escape from this issue in the glorious land? Well, these are relatives. We have Edom, which is the descendants of Esau. We have Moab and Ammon, the descendants of Lot. Mm -hmm. Now, Smith begins, the facts stated last week relative to the campaign of the French against Turkey and the repulse of the former at St. John d'Arche, however you pronounce that, were drawn chiefly from the Encyclopedia Americana. From the same source, we gather further particulars respecting the retreat of the French into Egypt and the additional reverses which compelled them to evacuate the country. Abandoning a campaign in which one-third of the army had fallen victims to war and the plague, the French retired from Saint-Jean-d'Arcain and after a fatiguing march of 26 days re-entered Cairo and Egypt. They thus abandoned all conquests they had made in Judea and the glorious land, Palestine with all of its provinces, here called countries, fell back again under the oppressive rule of the Turk. Edom, Moab, and Ammon, lying outside of the limits of Palestine, south and east of the Dead Sea and the Jordan, were out of the line of the march of the Turks from Syria to Egypt, and so escaped the ravages of that campaign. On this passage, Adam Clark has the following note. These and other Arabians, they, the Turks, have never been able to subdue. They still occupy the deserts and receive a yearly pension of 40,000 crowns of gold from the Ottoman emperors to permit the caravans with the pilgrims from Mecca to have a free passage. Now, how would we place this? I mean, Smith is making use of an encyclopedia and a commentator. Yeah, but it doesn't seem that he's even really addressing what the verse is saying. No, he's not. So how else can we address this? Well, I mean, first, we know that it has nothing to do with uh, that time period. It's right. not dealing with the, time of the French Revolution and, 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 the, and following. Um, it's not. So now his, I mean, I guess he addresses they shall escape out of his hand. That's sort of, well, it's not going to cover that territory. They're lying outside of Palestine. But that's, that's definitely not what it's talking about. Uh, escaping out of his hand 
is, I mean, if it's not even involved, right? So how that that even would apply, and how that's an escape, I don't know. Anyway, now of course he's going to have a glorious land being Palestine, and we know that that's not the case. So the glorious land is the United States. So I mean, it, I mean, he's just completely wrong, but. Uh, but we can also see that this really wouldn't apply, uh, you know, if he's going to have to try to apply this to the history that he is, it's not really a good application. But he is taking it literally, you know, at least I guess in a sense he's kind of consistent. Okay. But, uh, you know, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, we know that we have that in Ezekiel along with Philistia. And and we've interpreted that to be the Protestants. Now, now I, sh- I say we in the, this study group. I know that uh, Jeff had applied this more to the world, which I don't think would be consistent because these are relatives, not pagans. Now, we do have the Philistines, which aren't relatives, in Ezekiel that are going to be listed. They're going to go sort of in a in the reverse order. I think it's Philistia, Ammon, Moab, and Edom, if I remember correctly. Chapter 21. Which chapter is that again? Uh, no, not 21. 25. So how's it go? Abin, Ammon, Moab, Edom, and then Philistia in chapter Ezekiel 25. And so we have to understand them symbolically. You know, I guess that would be the main difference that, that Smith has is he's, go, he's going to take this all as a literal prophecy. Right. And, but it's pretty clear that we would have to understand in this time, this is symbolic. Wasn't it also symbolic really in 1871? That's what I mean in this time that we're right. we're talking about in in the time after after five thirty eight that you know the king of the north has to can't be literally the king of the north king of the south can't be the king of the south uh, Egypt can't literally be Egypt right Edom Moab right. and Ammon can't literally be Edom Moab and Adam the the glorious land is no longer the land of Israel. So his application and trying to place this directly at 1798 mm-hmm. has several, several issues, really. Yeah, there's lots of issues. Um, and, you know, we can see that, that this understanding of 1798 and 1989, of course, doesn't enter into his mind. But it, but we can see it that it occurs in earlier verses that there are two times at the end that right. there's this repeat of history built into Daniel 11 that that Uriah Smith and pretty much everyone else misses. So he is looking for uh, this history to be fulfilled, dealing with uh, the Ottoman Empire and so forth, and he makes predictions which don't which don't come to pass. Right. So, I mean, he, he makes some failed prophecies. Now, I mean, people, people have made predictions lots of times. So it's not like, you know, he's the first one to do that. Um, but he's, he's applying what's, so we believe that, that the fall of the Ottoman Empire is marked on August 11th, 1840. And so then you have this whole thing of the sick man of the East of the Ottoman Empire. What's going to happen to it? And so he is going to try to to fit these verses into what happens with the overthrow of the king of the north, right? But right. It, it becomes rather confusing uh, because things don't really happen the way that he expects. Louis F. Weir addresses this, and um, I was actually reading some articles regarding this i can't remember the thing was on my other computer so i'd have to find them again but one was an article by um, amazing discoveries where they're sort of refuting lewis f weir because they believe in uriah smith's interpretation let's see if i can find this but anyway that's that's kind of surprising amazing discoveries does that um interesting what, what's surprising? That amazing discoveries would side with uh, the other side, opposite of Louis F. Weir. It's 
Well, they've never accepted Louis F. Weir. Louis, Louis F. Is it Louis or Louis? Louis, Louis, Louis F. Weir. Yeah, they've never accepted Louis F. Weir. Amazing Discoveries has never. Unfortunate. Yeah, well, um, because they accept Uriah Smith. They, they take we do, Uriah too, Smith. the parts that are right. <laughs> I guess but yeah, not. but yeah, they don't they don't take the position we do in Daniel eleven verse forty to forty five. Not examining it critically, I guess. I don't know. Surprised. Yeah, but I can't find it here. So it's yeah. Now I did find. Uh, now I sent it to Stephen, but I guess I should uh, address this other point. So we were discussing uh, the paper by Lewis F. Weir is. Um, it's, it's a paper called Before Probation Closes. It was written in 1950, or, yeah, 1950. And so in that statement that uh, Stephen had referred us to yesterday, where it talks about Christendom or, like, all of Christendom or something like that, and the papacy combining to overthrow the Soviet Union, atheistic communism, people remember that state statement? Some of it. Yeah. Okay, let me see if I can quickly find this here. Okay, I can't find it here. Anyway, it, there was a statement about uh, Christendom, right? And so the way that Louis F. Weir uh, defines uh, all of Christendom or uh, is, okay, why is this not opening? Okay, let's do it this way. Is, uh, let me see here, because when he talks about the nations of Christendom, Christendom, that is Europe and America, he says uh, uh, the countries spiritually led, to, or spiritually tied to Europe, headed by America and the Vatican. So when he so what he's looking at is Christendom refers to and that's who's going to overthrow the Soviet Union is the papacy. And led by the, or headed by the United States and uh, the papacy. And that's what happened in 1980s, in the 1980s, correct? Okay. Right. Is that how we understand it? So we know that the United States connected with the Vatican, with the papacy to overthrow the Soviet Union, but, but also uh, the countries of Europe. The Christian countries of Europe were involved in that. Would we agree with that historically? Historically, yeah. So historically, Louis F. Weir was correct. So, so he's writing this in 1950. Um, now he he develops the thought further on um, on on how that is is going to come about, but. Uh, we can say that Louis F. Weir predicted 1989, not as to the date, but as to the event and how it was going to unfold. So I remember reading Louis F. Weir's material, understanding that this, you know, verses uh, 40B and and sort of what follows, so that when the Soviet Union, when the wall came down in 1989, I recognized that it is a fulfillment of prophecy. Didn't recognize it as the time of the end because that's not something that he taught. It's something Jeff taught. But when we have this view of Uriah Smith's and you, you compare them, we, we can see that the place where it diverges is when we understand that we're addressing the papacy as the king of the north. And even to some degree, you know, when you have a pagan Rome as the king of the north, that you're moving away from Greece to some other entity. But, but especially when we see the papacy as the king of the north in verse 36, and he's going to say, well, this is France. I mean, that's really where the divergence occurs, because he's, he's suggesting that we have to take literally the territory of the king of the north. And that's not the way that William Miller does it. Right. So Miller has a different interpretation again. But, uh, you know, Spain is the king of the south and, and Great Britain is the king of the north, which doesn't really make sense. But so 
you know, people have to make a decision about this. Are they going to accept Uriah Smith's interpretation? Or are they going to accept a more consistent interpretation, which is, is very consistent in understanding that we have to apply Egypt and Sodom, right? So those characteristics to France, not literally to Egypt at the time of the end. So hopefully that's as clear, you know, we've made it as clear as possible what the issue is. Okay. Anybody else have any other comment? I did find a couple of links there to the amazing discoveries things, but you know, unfortunately it's for sale, but uh, about Lewis yeah. Effler. Yeah. I think the one last link there is a PDF, I think, that we can download. Okay. The verse continues. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Now, Smith's application continues. On the retreat of the French to Egypt, a Turkish fleet landed 18,000 men at Abukir. Napoleon immediately attacked the place, completely routing the Turks and reestablishing his authority in Egypt. But at this point, severe reverses to the French arms in Europe called Napoleon home to look after the interests of his own country. The command of the troops in Egypt was left with General Kleber, who, after a period of untiring activity for the benefit of the army, was murdered by a Turk in Cairo. And the command was left with Abdallah Mano, with an army which could not be recruited. Every loss was serious. Meantime, the English government, as the ally of the Turks, had resolved to wrest Egypt from the French. March 13, 1800, an English fleet disembarked a body of troops at Abakir. The French gave battle the next day, but were forced to retire. On the 18th of March, Abakir surrendered. On the 28th, reinforcements were brought by a Turkish fleet, and the Grand Vizier approached from Syria with a large army. The 19th, Rosetta surrendered to the combined forces of the English and the Turks. At Ramana, a French corps of 4,000 men was defeated by 8,000 English and 6,000 Turks. At El Menayar, 5,000 French were obliged to retreat. May 16, by the vizier who was pressing forward to Cairo with 20,000 men. The whole French army was now shut up in Cairo and Alexandria. Cairo capitulated on June 27, and Alexandria on September 2. Four weeks later, October 1, 1801, the preliminaries of peace were signed at London. Egypt shall not escape, were the words of the prophecy. This language would imply that Egypt would be brought into subjection to some power from whose dominion it would desire to be released. As between the French and the Turks, how did this question stand with the Egyptians? They preferred French rule. In R.R. Madden's travels in Egypt, Nubia, Turkey, and Palestine in the years 1824 to 27, published in London in 1829, it is stated that the French were much regretted by the Egyptians and extolled as benefactors, that for the short period they remained, they left traces of amelioration <clears throat> and that if they could have established their power, Egypt would now be completely civilized. In view of this testimony, the language would not be appropriate if applied to the French, for the Egyptians did not desire to escape out of their hands. They did desire to escape from the hands of the Turk, but could not. So Smith is implying that Egypt did not wish to be under the control of, as he says, the Turk, and I think later the Ottoman Empire, that they preferred to be under the control of the French. Is there any other comment on this? To me, that's the saying that, uh, let's see here. Um, they didn't want to be un under any power. <laughs> I would think that any nation that was subjected to another dominion of a domination of another power wouldn't want to be any, any power, but I guess it's the best, best of the two or something. Or that goes, that saying. I just, yeah, it struck me odd 
Well, here's Egypt today. Are they more French or are they more Islamic? Islamic for sure, Muslim. Right. So can we agree or do we disagree with Smith on this? Well, I mean, we disagree with the whole fulfillment of how he sees this prophecy unfolding at the wrong time. But, um, I mean, there's problems with his interpretation, even if he, you try to put it within its context. I mean, he sort of picks and chooses things. He's very much doing that. Yeah. Basically, what he's trying to do is he's trying to mold these words to fit his narrative. Yeah. And the unfortunate yeah. thing is he's doing a bad job of it. Yeah, but people might not notice. Now, uh, I'm looking here at uh, this article from, it's a Lewis F. Weir critique. Okay. Um, the critique of Lewis F. Weir's objections to Smith's position on the Eastern question. Now, this is by uh, David H. Thiel. I don't know if any of you know him. I'm friends with him on Facebook, so I sh should uh, be able to talk to him about it. So he, he's going through the reasons, um, sort of the personal reasons why Lewis F. Weir is attempting to vindicate James White's position on the King of the North. And he's trying to understand why there's this harshness in dealing with Uriah Smith's position. And, and, and he says it has to do with injustice that happened to him that planted seeds of bitterness. Um, Right. So he says lengthy delay in the fulfillment of prophecy breeds unbelief and skepticism in predicted outcomes. Such doubt can only drive the desperate to contrive a new method of hermeneutics that only add to the confusion by reason of its apparent plausibility. James White is not vindicated in his position merely because of the majority of scholars and church leaders now appear to hold his view. Reproved by the Lord, according to his son, Willie White, for bringing distrust and disunity at a time when the church was supposed to press together. James White sank down in discouragement. So um, the whole tenor of this this paper is basically, you know, incorrect. It, it says here, Ellen White never endorsed James White's position of the glorious mountain being the United States of America. Now, of course, we don't take that the glorious holy mountain is the United States of America. Right. So. Uh, she did enjoy endorse uh, the hermeneutic system of William Miller, which Uriah Smith also used. The corollary position is that the people representing the three angels' message as well as the Latin cry will not adopt another hermeneutic system than what William Miller used. So he's suggesting that Lewis F. Weir is using a different system of hermeneutics than Miller and that Uriah Smith is correct. So this is put out by amazing discoveries but uh what's the difference between glory or what is it uh the glorious the land's the united states and the glorious holy mountain is god's church thank you like in the sides of the north is god god's place well it's not just dealing with the mountain of the congregation on the sides of the north no yeah okay it's just that in verse 45, he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace. Um, how, do, how do we get the glorious holy mountain as the church? Or yeah, that's, that that's, the, that's S God's people. That's God's people at the end of the world, right? So S SDA church or God's people in general? Well, it's not going to be the SDA organization because it won't exist. So, yes, God's mm -hmm. people, right? The, the 144,000. So... So the glorious holy mountain is not the same as uh, the glorious land, right? So we'll we'll get to that detail there. But uh, so the glorious land is the United States because we have to apply it spiritually. We're not going to take literally that this is about a battle dealing with with you know the land of Israel, right? And the tidings out of the east, right? Well, then that would have to do with Islam. Right. All these types of things that you're going to be using in futurism to interpret prophecy. If you're going to apply these verses literally, but then you would have this conflict with the book of Revelation. Now, a person could argue, well, Daniel here is just dealing literally. The book of Revelation is de dealing symbolically. But then you have them in contradiction to each other. 
in what in in how they're approaching things. So we have this whole spiritual battle, which isn't dealing with the nations of Israel and the land of Palestine in, in the end days in Revelation, but in the book of Daniel it is, and that would be a contradiction. Okay. Verse 43, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. In illustration of this verse, we quote the following from Historic Echoes of the Voice of God, page 49. History gives the following facts. When the French were driven out of Egypt and the Turks took possession, the sultan permitted the Egyptians to reorganize their government as it was before the French invasion. He asked of the the Egyptians neither soldiers, guns, nor fortifications, but left them to manage their own affairs independently, with the important exception of putting the nation under tribute to himself. In the Articles of Agreement between the Sultan and the Pasha of Egypt, it was stipulated that the Egyptians should pay annually to the Turkish government a certain amount of gold and silver, and 600,000 measures of corn, and 400,000 of barley. The Libyans and the Ethiopians, quoted, the Kushim, quoted, says Dr. Clark, the unconquered Arabs who have sought the friendship of the Turks, and many of whom are tributary to them to this present time. Again, this is poorly presented. I don't think that, that this really gives a even anywhere near a a fair support of what Smith is trying to argue here. He's forcing the issue to fit his narrative. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if if I'm understanding it correctly, the he here is the king mm-hmm. of the north, having power over treasures of gold and silver. Is yeah, so he's focused yeah, on, on, on the king of the north uh, being this, this power. In, in this battle. Right. right now. So the, the French are driven out of Egypt. The, Tur- the Turks take possession. So he's saying that you got France. It's going to have Egypt come against it. It's going to have Turkey come against it. And then, uh, and then the king of the north becomes this power then that's going to be taking over Egypt and Palestine is sort of how, how his story goes. So right. one is he, He's having he's having the land of Israel as being a part of fulfillment of prophecy at a time when Ellen White says, you know, the land of Israel has no part in prophecy, you know, in, in our time. Right. That we, we have to understand that, that we have we have Adventism, we have Protestantism. We don't have these literal nations anymore. They become symbols, but we don't take them literally. Right. Okay. Now this this book that Smith gives rec- reference to was published in the Advent Christian Publication Society of 1860, and it was written by a J. Couch. Anybody have any ideas to who this is? No. Okay. So if we're looking at this in a spiritual concept. We would have to say the king of the north will have power over the economy. But what would be the precious things of Egypt? And why the Libyans and Ethiopians being at his steps? Correct. Yeah, he doesn't really explain this. How else can this be addressed? Well, I mean, the way that we address it is the treasures of gold, silver, the precious things of Egypt. I mean, this is... Uh, the papacy at the end of the world, we can understand these these as symbols. The Libyans representing the uh, the rich and the Ethiopians, the poor, I believe. Right. Libya's which which is the rich place? Is it Ethiopia that's poor and Libya that's rich? I I would say you got it right the first time that that Libya would be more wealthy than Ethiopia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so we understand this at the end of the world that this is, is to be understood spiritually. The, the precious things of Egypt, that Egypt represents, you know, one is its atheistic aspects, but it's also, uh, its religion, right? 
So, so this represents the world, the things of the world. So what would be the precious things of Egypt in that context? And these would be the things of delight or beauty, the pleasant things. Would it be their idols? Well, yes. But the, the pleasure, the hedonism of the world, right? Okay. So, I mean, it, to apply this spiritually. Now, now people might say, okay, well, you, you're just making things up, right? You're just taking these symbols and you're just giving, you're just saying these are symbols and we're going to interpret them these ways. But we could look through scripture line upon line and show what Egypt symbolizes. We can show what Libya symbolizes. We can so show what Ethiopia symbolizes, right? Okay. So, so we're going to take them as symbols, especially as, as we deal with the end of the world. And, and if you're going to take... Um, Daniel 11 verse 45 as preceding Daniel 12 verse 1 when Michael shall stand up right so it's so in 45 it's going to say and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and it should be uh, and the glorious holy mountain yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him well this is at the end of the world so he has this being fulfilled in the past Right. Right. So, he, so he's going to look at events that are happening with the fall of Turkey. Right. The Turkey is going to come to his end. And when Turkey comes to his end, then Christ is going to return. Now, when did Turkey come to its end in, in the absolute sense, as far as as the Ottoman? About, 19, about 1922, was it? In 1922 or 21, November. I can't remember the date. November something. November 1st, 1921, I think it was. Uh, so so that's the end of the Ottoman Empire, you know, the absolute sort of end. I mean, obviously, Turkey still exists as a country. But um, if you're going to then try to apply this to our time, you're going to have to, to have Turkey, which out of all of the Islamic countries, Turkey is not very, uh, you know, 19... 22 you were right so november 1st 1922 i always get that year wrong um so now turkey as a country as far as an islamic country it's not really a very radical islamic country okay right like it's not really involved in all of this stuff that's happening yeah so i understand it seems to be more, more of a modern country yeah yeah so and and it, and also the Ottoman Empire is ended. So I mean, Uriah Smith's made some predictions about the end of the Ottoman Empire and the second coming of Christ, which never came about. But people are still trying to revive these interpretations. But I just don't see how you can. Now, of course, we know our movement is founded upon a different interpretation of from Daniel eleven verse thirty six to forty five which I think is way more consistent with the rest of scripture. But there is um, within, you know, within Adventism, within conservative Adventism, we have these issues regarding Uriah Smith that still still are affecting um, conservative Adventism. Like our understanding of um, our understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, is not the most common view. Now, when we were looking at um, Swearingen's book, he has a view that's much more similar to ours. And I'm just going to, that, that's the book Tidings Out of the Northeast. I'm just going to, I want to show you what he says here. So when he deals with these verses, let me see if I can find it quickly. So this is his an examination of Daniel 11, verse 42 to 43, the king of the north versus the Eth- Libyans and Ethiopians. He says, so far in examination of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, we have established the following prophetic trends. The king of the north describes a resurrected papacy. And the king of the south equates to a Soviet atheistic communism, which collapses in 1991 through an influence of the Roman Catholic Church. 
the future entrance of papal Rome into the glorious land of the Christian church through the legislation of Sunday sacredness and the escape of Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon, which is a description of how God's faithful followers will exit all apostate religions, refusing submission to Sunday legislation and render obedience to the true Bible Sabbath. So that's dealing with verse 41, right? So we would agree generally with what he's saying here, correct? This is Swearingen. And uh, so we so we agree with that. That's basically a summary of verse uh, 40 and 41. And he says this particular chapter will discuss the specific passage of Daniel 11, verse 42 to 43. Our examination of these two passages will reveal two main prophetic trends. The papal seizure of all the precious things of Egypt, which symbolizes the submission of both the former Soviet nations and the remaining communist countries to papal authority. And the submission of the Libyans and Ethiopians, which he has here symbolizing Islamic compliance to papal authority. So he has a different interpretation of those. But the one thing we can say here, when we look at all the precious things of Egypt, what? how do we understand Egypt? What does it symbolize? Dwight stepped out for a minute. So, so, so what does Spiritualism? Spiritualism? Okay, well, yes, but what about the world? What about the UN? Right, right. So, ultimately it's the UN. Right. right, yeah. So spiritualism, right? The dragon, it's the dragon power. And, and we can see there's places in the book of Ezekiel that Egypt, its rivers are described in sort of a dragon fashion, the, the Nile and so forth. Right. So we so we can see it's it's the dragon power. It's this spiritualistic power. Now, when this movement began and we looked at the fall of the Soviet Union, we didn't really consider, well, if the Soviet Union was representing this dragon power, Egypt. Well, obviously it doesn't, it doesn't end because you still need the dragon power at the end of the world in the Sunday law. So, so the Soviet Union fell, but it only came up to the neck, this flood, right? That is the head survived. And Jeff for a time was teaching that that referred to the capital to Moscow. And so back in 2000, uh, 18 and 19, and even going back to 2016, you know, we were looking at this, that Russia had a part to play in Bible prophecy. But we've taken the position that when the Soviet Union fell, that characteristic of Egypt, which in 1798 is France, and in 1989 is the Soviet Union, at the end of the world is the UN. Does that make sense to people? So we, we've taken a different position than Jeff. Jeff doesn't really address this in the way that we do. So we take the position that Egypt represents the UN and that that is, is Egypt. It's spiritualism. It's the dragon power. And now we sort of had that already, but we didn't really see that when the Soviet Union fell, that this had moved this characteristic of atheism had moved from the Soviet Union to the UN. Now, the UN always had this atheistic aspect to it, but it now becomes the head. Does that make sense to people? Yes. Okay. So here, uh, when Swearingen's talking about this, uh, that the precious things of Egypt symbolizes the submission of both the former Soviet Union's and remaining communist countries to papal authority, that's going to be true. But if we're looking at what the precious things of Egypt are, that is, those are the characteristics of Egypt that now are possessed by the UN. So the precious things of Egypt must refer to the United Nations. So that's the world. That means that the papacy in verse 43 is conquering the world. Now we have an interpretation of Swearingen, which is different than Jeff had. So Jeff had the Libyans and the Ethiopians referring to the rich and the poor. Now, Swearingen says that this symbolizes Islamic compliance to papal authority. So what do we think about Swearingen's interpretation? How would the Libyans and Ethiopians symbolize Islam? Got me there. Okay. The, I mean, 
I don't see the, especially the Ethiopian symbolizing Islam. Yeah, I would have a harder heart. I mean, I mean, Islam has inhabited a lot of that era territory now, but we're we're looking at these as symbols from from the Bible, not as what those territories are today, right? Right. Okay. So Ethiopia is. Um, so let me see here. So we we would have to look at these verse these words and how they're applied historically. So um, so Libya is uh i'm just gonna where is it mentioned here in the scriptures so that's three eight six four is the hebrew number strong's number you're gonna have it in uh numbers 321 so it just talks about the libnites uh numbers 26 58 again in second chronicles 12 verse 3 um it's gonna mention them then with him came uh without number that came with him out of Egypt, the Libyans, the Sukkims, and the Ethiopians, right? So often Libya and Ethiopia are mentioned together, Second Chronicles 16, verse 8. We're not the Ethiopians and the, Lib- uh, the Libyans. They call them Lubims in the King James, a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen, yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them out of thy hand. Now, Ezekiel is going to use uh, Libyans in chapter 30, verse 5, and, and he, this one here. And this is a lament for Egypt. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Hallowed ye, woe worth the day. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near a cloudy day and it shall be the time of the heathen the heathen there being the goyim right the nations and the sword shall come upon egypt and great pain shall fall shall be in ethiopia when the slain shall fall in egypt and they shall take away her multitude and her foundation shall be broken down ethiopia and libya and lydia and all the mingled people and chub and the men of the land that is in league shall fall with them by the sword. Thus saith the Lord, they also that uphold Egypt shall fall, and the pride of her power uh, shall come down from the tower of Syene, shall they fall in it by the sword, saith the Lord God. Yeah. So, so we've looked at these verses before, dealing with the pride of her power. So, so all this is saying is whatever Libya and Ethiopia are they're in a sense a part of Egypt, right? They're connected to Egypt all of the time in Scripture. So they're they're things that are um, they're, they're included in Egypt in some way. Now, as far as Ethiopia itself, so we don't have anything where it talks about Libya uh, being the rich that I can see from any of these verses that I looked at. Uh, but when it comes to Ethiopia. Um, uh, let me see here. So it, Ethiopia is usually uh, the, the original Hebrew is Cush, right? So you got uh, the sons of Ham that are Cush. Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim is usually translated as Egypt. Cush is sometimes translated as Ethiopia. And uh, then you have, um, so you have uh, here. So the sons of Ham, Cush, Mitzrayim, Put, Right, P put, that's P H U T in English. And that's that's generally referred to uh parts of Persia and Canaan. So those are the four sons of of Ham, right? So we can see that they're still all that they're still related. Cush is related to Egypt. Ethiopia is related to Egypt, in that they're both sons of Ham. So I think what we could conclude from this, whether we try to, however we try to interpret them, is that they are still part of Egypt. They're part of, they're, they're clinging to that aspect. It's a part of the world, whether the rich and the poor, however we want to look at it, I would just say that they're, they're connected to Egypt. So, so whatever Egypt is, the United, the United Nations, that there are other people 
that are going to be at his steps. That is, they're going to be following along with the papacy as well. So it's just sort of tying up, I guess, the loose ends, like all of these stragglers, the hangers on. How, how does that sound? Does that make any sense based on what we looked at? I think it's a bit better than what Smith is doing. Yeah. Now, it's also interesting that we have um, uh, Ethiopia mentioned in Isaiah 11.11, 11, right? So um, and this verse we need to consider. So we know the sim- significance of Isaiah 11.11 11 as a symbol, but also Ellen White quoting that on October. Uh, it, well, in the vision she had October 23rd, 1850. Uh, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, which, of course, in Hebrew is Mitzrayim, from Pathros, um, Pathros uh, being uh, uh, related to put. Right. So that's Persia and from Cush, which is Ethiopia. And from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea, right? So we can see that we have all of these these, um, symbols here in this. So God is going to stretch out and gather a remnant of his people from all of these places. So God's people are gathered out of Egypt. They're gathered out of Libya, gathered out of Ethiopia. They're gathered out of Persia. They're out of Shinar, Babylon, right? Now, historically, when we look at Daniel 11, 11, we know that this second time is the Babylonian captivity. The first time is when they're, they come out of Egypt. The second time, symbolically, is going to refer to our time. But literally, it's going to refer to the Babylonian captivity. And so we apply it symbolically in our time. So we we need to know that these histories in the past are to be understood as types of what's going to happen in the present. And so in Daniel chapter 11, when it's going to be talking about Egypt and Libya and Ethiopia, we would not take those as literal. We would take them as the repeat of history. We're not looking for literally Egypt, literally Libya and literally Ethiopia to be involved in end time prophecy. Amen. But there are Adventists who are looking at these things literally. I mean, I've had discussions with them. Actually, it's not some that seems to be prevalent. Yes, I would say that it's, it's uh, it, well, 30 years ago, um, you would have very few Adventists who would be doing that. Adventists have become more futuristic in their interpretation of prophecy. So the reason why I was interested in this movement is that I studied lots of other material from different movements within Adventism. Even people like light bearers were using futurism in interpreting Revelation 9. They were trying to apply, you know, these things that are symbols in literal ways. So they would look at these people like locusts, you know, and and this was James Rafferty. And he was saying, well, see, these are helicopters, um, you know, which I just thought was crazy. I mean, you know, we can't. And, just, and, the, yeah. and the 1260, that's, that's 1290, right. and 1260, 1290, and 1335 were also being applied futuristic. Yes. Right. yes. That so people, just amazes me. Margaret yeah. Davis even. Yeah. So so I saw all this happening within Adventism. And this movement didn't do that. It was really clear that these things that had happened historically happened historically and that they become uh, connected with our time, either as typical. Right. So that is there's typical aspects of past histories which, you know, the history in connection with this prophecy is repeated. Not that we repeat the prophecy. We look at how the prophecy is fulfilled, and then we can see line upon line that we have a reform line in our history, and we can take the elements of that fulfilled prophecy and and apply them in an antitypical way 
to our time. And that becomes way more consistent. It's the door to this fanciful speculation is closed. Because when you're going to reinterpret a prophecy, you, you can almost bend it any way you, you want. But when you look at the prophecy as it was fulfilled and do it line upon line, then you have a clear pattern and structure. And, and lots of what's happened in this movement, you know, after July 18th was, was really what I would call futurism. It was sort of a mixture of things. So when we are trying to predict things with time elements and, and events, that's not how you do it. Right. So there's this inconsistency. And we see this inconsistency has existed within Adventism for a long time, sort of not on the surface, kind of under the surface. But it's it's now come to the surface. And so we're in this conflict within Adventism with what we are teaching. That is, there's so much opposed to what we are teaching. And, and we can see that with uh, uh, David H. Steele's. Um, article there dealing with Lewis F. Weir that, you know, Lewis F. Weir, even though he actually predicted the events that happened in 1989 to 1991, um, we can just dismiss him. And, and if you read this article, um, I should just give people a link to this article. I'll put it in the chat here. Um, so I'll just type it in here quick. That really he tries to, um, he, he does, a, well, he tries to tear down uh, Louis F. Weir as a person. It's an attack upon the person rather than a study of, of what Louis F. Weir is saying, right? So, so you understand that if I'm going to address what someone is saying, I would go to the Bible and compare scriptures with scripture, right? I would listen to what that person is saying. I would present their arguments. And um, and then I would show why they are wrong. What I wouldn't do is say, well, there's a problem with his motives. Here's what happened to him as, as a church. He had his credentials removed from him based upon some rumors and gossip. So after the death of his wife, he got remarried. And because of gossip and rumors, they took away his credentials. Now, that's that's the reason that they gave for taking away his credentials. And it could be very much that they took away his credentials for other reasons and used this these gossips and rumors uh, uh, as as a way of an excuse to silence him. Right. That happens. Yeah, that's the way I understood it. They wanted to prevent him from attending the. Was it the Australian conference or something to present? So they took away his credentials? Is that how right. that? Now, now, this article yeah. does, yeah. So this article doesn't address it in that way. It actually leans to, more towards what, you know, that, that the fact that his credentials were taken away created this bitterness that then led him to have this attack. Now, there's some problems with that. Um, didn't he write oh, the, those things before they took away his credentials? Or? Mm, yeah, those yes. ideas. Yes, yes. So there's there's where you have some problems, uh, but you know there's there's sort of an overlap, right? So I'm just trying to look at the dates here. So he was ordained in 1925. So his his wife died in um, 1942. So shortly after he remarried in 1943, he then false accusations of improper conduct were there. So this is going to be earlier. Uh, the South Australian Conference Executive Committee voted to dismiss Weir on March 9th, 1943. And, and so there's some That's women involved in the matter that wrote letters to trying to clear his name. And he, he was not disfellowshipped over the appearance of indiscretion. Uh, but he was never reinstated as a pastor, even though he reapplied in 1954. So this is, yeah, so he's going to write this stuff after all of these rumors happen. So him and his wife, Alma, remained faithful members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in good standing. So he died uh, three weeks before his 71st birthday from a heart attack. 
But his influence of his theories on hermeneutics and defense of James White would live on, swelling in popularity until it became the majority view today. So they're going to look at, in this article, David H. Thiel is going to say, basically, that this this new human hermeneutic is basically, you know, it's it's kind of part of the new theology. But of course, he's not representing uh, Louis F. Weir's hermeneutics. He's not actually addressing any of this in detail. He's he's dealing more with the, the peripheral events regarding these controversies rather than just doing a Bible study. That makes sense. So here's here's another paragraph. He says, Elder Lewis F. Weir wrote and published books and articles on Bible hermeneutics, prophecy and the three angels messages. He strongly questioned the validity of Uriah Smith's position on the Eastern question simply because historical events had not panned out as many had thought and taught. Now, I would say that that's not correct to say that he questioned the validity of Uriah Smith's position on the Eastern question simply because historical events had not panned out would be absolutely false. That's not the reason that Louis F. Weir took his position, right? And so he's going to go on and show or try to show that the whole argument that Louis F. Weir has just has to do with his bitterness of what happened to him, which is, um, anyway, you you could read the article. I don't know, maybe if we should go through this at some point. Something uh, something I call mind reading. Or, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> ascribing motives that you have no idea. Yeah, well, I mean, I have people do that to me all the time. You know, they, you know, I say something and they believe that there's some motive behind why I take a particular position, something that they can they can attribute to some aspect they believe of my character, whether it's, you know, jealousy or bitterness or something, right? So so they instead of addressing the idea from the Bible, you just attack the man in some way, right? You believe this because of, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and I don't think that that's how we should look at things. We should look at it, it and, and we all can do it. I'm not saying that. That we have never done it, you know, that we look at a person, we have a view of a person, and that we can dismiss what they say. But we have to be really careful about that. And so I try to be aware when I, when, especially when I have personal feelings about someone, um, I, I have to set those aside when I'm examining what they're saying. That's uh, critical thinking skills, basically, which you're lacking, uh, seems everywhere, because, yeah, don't worry about the person's motives or... Whatever, I think it just, what is it, uh, yeah, just look at the facts, discuss the facts. Yeah. And I've many times where I've had to set aside my personal feelings to learn something that somebody was presenting because I didn't particularly like the person. Um, and, and I was glad that I was able to do that because I learned things that if I had not listened because I had this personal feelings about that person, and, and also, so it's really important to recognize that you have personal feelings about a person and, and try to figure out why. Why does somebody rub you the wrong way? You know, sometimes it can be because, you know, they're mean to you, but sometimes they're just personalities I don't like. You know, you know I don't like loudmouths, for instance. Well, this is just the exact counsel that Ellen White was trying to give at the 1888 conference was yeah. uh, look past the messenger and listen to the message. Right, because all of us have aspects, you know, and, and I say the loudmouth things because because I'm a bit of a loudmouth. So um, that's probably why I don't like them. But yeah, right. so we need to we need to recognize why people rub us the wrong way, and we shouldn't be we shouldn't be involved in party politics theology, right? Our beliefs should be based upon God's word, not upon who advocates them or how we feel about different people when they're presenting something. Okay, Dwight? Yep. Uh, what, what do you think we should do with this? I mean, I'm going to go over this article on my own in a bit more detail, and I'm going to talk to David Thiel about it. Um, no relation to Edwin Thiel, by the way, but it's spelled the same. And try to get his take on Because, you know, I'm friends with him on Facebook. He, he says some things that are good. He says some things I don't agree with. But I'm going to ask him about this article. 
what you said there are some things you agree some things you don't that's what Ellen White said as well about uh, I think it was Wagner she said I don't agree with or yeah I don't agree with all of his things but she said as well uh, she was still going to listen to it and encourage all of them to listen yeah well what she said is that some of his views presented differed from how she would express them so, something to that effect uh, but she actually came to recognize that he was correct. Neat. So, so it wasn't that, it, it was just that the way that he was expressing them was different. Not so much from what he meant, but just ways of presenting. Um, inc- that's the way included, I understand her statement. Right. She included that disclaimer when she said she didn't agree with him, but. Yeah, well, she doesn't say she doesn't agree with them. That's not what she says. She doesn't say, I don't agree with him. She says, I can't remember the exact words, but it more has to do with how they're expressed. It's in the 1888 sermons by Ellen White there. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Anyway, so, so, you know, I want to go through this a little bit more in detail, this, this, uh, article by Thiel, David Thiel. Well, as you've been going through several points of this, I was able to download this historic echoes of the voice of God. Okay. And it's kind of interesting how this guy, Crouch, Couch, whatever, uh, is in almost lockstep with Uriah Smith. Because okay. a, lot of, a lot of this book is covering Daniel 11. Okay. Now, of course, it's not an Adventist book. Yes, it is. Oh, it is? Yes, it was published. Okay. It was published by the Advent Press and has been placed okay. in... Well, well, Advent Press, I didn't think that's Seventh-day Adventist. No. I've never heard of the Advent Press as, as an Adventist. Uh... J. Couch, Historic Echoes of the Voice of God dealing with the 11th chapter of Daniel in 1860. And the Center for Adventist Research at Andrews University felt strongly enough to place a copy of this in the James White Library at Andrews. But it doesn't mean it's a Seventh-day Adventist author. Well, agreed. It doesn't. Right. So that's what I'm saying. Um, yeah, because I, I I I have this here, the same thing probably you're looking at it. So um because this is just looking at the yeah, the Advent Christian Publication Society is not is is a first day Adventist. Okay. Right. So my question would be why is Smith yet trying to make such a um such a bit about all this? Now it's it what's intriguing for me is the copy that they have at the James White Library was published in 1868. Yeah. Yet online they're showing this as being 1860. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. Um, so this, uh, yeah. So anyway, it's a first day Adventist uh, publication. It's not a seventh day Adventist publication. Okay. Mm-hmm. So Smith is accepting in this. <clears throat> that this is a literal prophecy and that's not much different from what couches is, is saying in this book either. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the, the Advent Christian church. Okay. Is, is the first day Adventists. Okay. I stand corrected. And they published out of Boston. Easy, easy conclusion to draw when being in the Adventist library. Well, I'm sure yeah, they've, they've got yeah. a whole bunch of other items too. Yeah. yeah. It seems like that's, yeah, I'm quite surprised some of the books that the ABC carries. Yeah. Really surprised. Like it's so yeah. obvious. <laughs> yeah, but here, the, these books are basically reference material for the history of Adventism. That's why they're there. Okay. So, okay. Well, we have, yeah. it sounds like we have some additional reading to do. Right. Now, we've We've covered or looked at this with verse 43 and covered Smith's statements. Mm -hmm. 
And now we have verses 44 and 45. Yeah. But I think we're going to cover those well enough in the time that we have remaining today. Yeah, we'll do that tomorrow. We'll and do then, that Sunday. What day is it today? Today's Thursday. Thursday. Okay, I was thinking it was Wednesday. Okay, yeah, so we'll do that Sunday. Um, yeah, so we got time to go over this material before Sunday. Yeah, because I think we do really need to establish um, what Lewis F. Weir's um, hermeneutic or methodology was, because the suggestion here is that he had this, you know, new, <laughs> you know, hermeneutic, right? Something that's really not Millerite under uh, uh, interpretation of prophecy. And, and I disagree with that, of course, right? I, I don't think Uriah Smith is following Miller's rules. No, I would agree. But, uh, yeah, and I, I, I can't find when, you know, how long ago this was written. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, this, this article uh, was created, this PDF was created in 2018. Looks like October 8th, 2018, I think. So that was sort of in, in the time period where... Um, this movement was being attacked and it, it might be sort of an indirect attack on this movement, you know, not explicitly stating that that's what they're trying to do. Okay. So we'll come back to this Sunday then. Okay. Any other thoughts, questions, or comments with what we've covered today? Shall we then close with prayer? Loving father in heaven, we thank you for all that you are doing in our lives. We thank you for the many blessings that you are providing we ask now, Father, for your guidance and your direction so that these things may take root within our lives, that we may be able to come again to study, to fellowship, to discuss that which you would have us to know. Direct us now. Bless us in guidance in all, guide us in all that you would have us to do so that we may more properly represent you to all with whom we come in contact. For this, we thank you and this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.